The Atlanta Falcons made the surprise pick of the 2024 NFL draft in taking Washington quarterback Michael Panic Sheeran. And we talk about if it was a massive mistake or not. All that and more coming up next during this episode of Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL, your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On NFL Podcast, your daily NFL podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Allstriker. I'm the host of Locked On Ravens and one of the many NFL experts here on our network. Free and available on all podcasting platforms that includes a video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your show. So be sure to subscribe, follow along, and check out everything we have going on here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We have a lot to talk about the NFL draft officially over. First, though, this episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and it's a big fan of Monopoly Go. The mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly to join your friends and download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. NFL draft, again, officially in the books. Bunch of surprises, bunch of good picks. Now, last week, pre draft, we talked about the big three quarterbacks. We talked with Locked On Bears with the number one pick. They took Caleb Williams, like we talked about. Number two, David Harrison. Jaden Daniels was the pick, like we talked about. Number three, then Drake May. We talked about that as well with Locked On Patriots. So we're talking about the other three first-round quarterbacks that were taken. First of all, Michael Penix was the surprise of the draft going to the Atlanta Falcons. We we'll talked with Aaron Freeman and Locked On Falcons about what that pick was, the decision behind it, and a lot more. Then we'll talk with Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings about the Vikings nabbing J.J. McCarthy. Then finally, Sarah Benger of Locked On Broncos joins us. We'll talk about Bo Nix and that pairing over there in Denver. So any further ado, let's first get into our conversation with Aaron Freeman of Locked On Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons shocked the NFL world on Thursday night in the 2024 NFL draft when they selected Michael Penix Jr., the quarterback out of Washington, with the eighth overall pick after signing Kirk Cousins to a mega contract just a couple months earlier. Here to talk about the whole Falcons situation with me is Aaron Freeman, the host of Locked On Falcons. And Aaron, I just want to start by getting what your initial reaction was to this pick. You're sitting there at eight. Maybe you're thinking edge rusher, some other defensive help. And Michael Penix Jr. is the pick by Roger Goodell. What was your reaction? And was there any shot in your mind that the Falcons were going to go that route? No, I was utterly shot. No, I didn't think there was any uh, shot that they would take him. I I did a podcast the day before saying, there's no chance. I can promise you, there's no chance they're going to take a quarterback in the top 10. And then they went and take a quarterback in the top 10. So I was utterly floored by it. And to me... The whole situation, Penix is not a bad player. You know, it's it's not about Michael Penix, the player. It's about the fact that the Falcons just signed Kirk Cousins to this four-year mega contract. And so when you talk about the other needs Atlanta had, I mean, was was this just a a bad use of a very valuable pick for Atlanta? Because obviously the, the goal is that you don't pick there for the foreseeable future. So maybe you get somebody who can immediately contribute. But Michael Penix is going to be sitting behind Kirk Cousins here for the foreseeable future. Yeah, you're right. It's not about the player. It's about the plan. And the plan is leaving you a lot of question marks. Uh, You know, opinions will vary about the player. You know, I like Michael Penix. I don't know if I love him as a top 10 pick, but, you know, to each their own. And he'll have an opportunity, hopefully, in the future, several years down the road to to prove all of his skeptics and doubters wrong and that he was well worth a top 10 pick. But you do wonder a little bit about what is the Falcons plan where they could have definitely used some help. Right. You know, they, they talk, they've been talking a big game since Raheem Morris's arrival uh, back in January, that this is a playoff team that they've already kind of built a playoff team. We just got to get the quarterback, right. But I'm a lot more skeptical of that. I've watched this team for the last couple of years as they've won seven games. And I feel like there are a lot more holes that they need to deal with. And especially when it comes to their pass rush, which, you know, at this point in time has been one of the weakest in the league. They made big leaps this past year. But a big reason why they made those leaps was the additions of players like Calais Campbell and Bud Dupree. And those guys are probably not coming back after they drafted four defensive linemen in this past year's draft. And so that pass rush really is lacking and they had a golden opportunity to get the premier pass rushers in this draft at eight, possibly trading back. We didn't see a defensive player come off the board till 
15 for Laya Tulatu. That was a player that a lot of people s- said that the Falcons loved. In fact, there were, you know, the Falcons came out after they drafted Penix and said, we were trying desperately to get back into round one so that we could draft Laya Tulatu. Uh, so I think there's a lot of questions with this choice for the Falcons. What is their plan? They have this three-year plan for Michael Penix and the two-year plan for Kirk Cousins. And how compatible are those two things? Those are a lot of the lingering questions coming out of this draft. Now, you mentioned that to you there was no shot that the Falcons were going to make this pick, but you did do a little homework on Michael Penix beforehand. What do you like about him as a player? What does he need to improve on? What's your overall upside for Penix in a Falcons uniform here? I like Penix. I don't necessarily see if, you know, I'm, I'm still waiting to see if there's upside for him to be more than a Kirk Cousins level player, which is a player that I think most people think is good enough to keep you in playoff contention, but probably not a guy that is going to win you, you know, Super Bowls or anything like that. But, you know, we'll, we'll see on that. I think play Penix is a good processor. I think that's probably his greatest strength. I know a lot of people point to the arm strength. That's certainly a plus category for him, but I think he's a very smart, decisive quarterback. And, you know, as he mass, he showed mastery of that Washington offense that he had been in for several years, going back to his days at Indiana. Uh, and I expect him to hopefully master the Falcons offense. Although, you know, who knows if uh, the same offensive coordinator is going to still be here when Penix, time to get the field to me the big questions with Penix are I think his mechanics need to be cleaned up now fortunately the Falcons have time to to work on that in the background as he sort of holds the clipboard behind Kirk Cousins um I also think he wasn't the greatest when it came to you know making plays off structure or dealing with pressure when he had pressure in his face some of that I think is owed to the mechanics and being a little wonky so that can be improved but that are those are some of the things that I think he's going to have to improve upon if he's going to be a high level quarterback uh in the NFL you mentioned Kirk Cousins there I mean how do you think he's feeling about all this? Apparently, he was, was he at a draft party in Atlanta or something? I think he, there was something about that. But how do you think Kirk is taking this news? And what do you think the dynamic is going to be between Kirk and Michael Penix when they start working together in Atlanta? Well, yeah, the, the news was that the Falcons informed Kirk Cousins while they were on the clock that they were taking Michael Penix. And, you know, according to his agent, he wasn't necessarily, you can read between the lines, he wasn't particularly happy about it, but he did reach out to Michael Penix after. And, you know, they had a private conversation. We don't know the details of that. But presumably, I think they will have a good working relationship with one another. I think Kirk is a professional tends to be a very nice guy. So I don't think he's going to give Michael Penix the cold shoulder. I just don't know if that's in Kirk Cousins' uh, personality to to sort of be a jerk <laughs> to Michael Penix for the next couple of years. So I think they will have a good working relationship. But I think what's going to be interesting about the Falcons, with, especially with those two, is one of the things that the Rams did when Raheem Morris was there is they kind of siloed the different quarterbacks. The uh, quarterback coach, Zach Robinson, worked pretty exclusively with the backup quarterback while Sean McVay, who's a play caller there in LA working with the starting quarterback and Matt Stafford the last couple of years. And now Zach Robinson's the offensive play caller in Atlanta. And I imagine he'll be working a lot with Kirk cousins for the next, uh, you know, couple of years while the Falcons have, you know, TJ Yates, their quarterback coach, as well as several other offensive assistants that have, you know, quarterback coaching in their background that I think they'll kind of silo Michael Penix. And one of those guys will kind of be the point man with Michael Penix. And maybe another guy is going to be working with backup quarterback Taylor Heineke. So I think you probably won't see nearly as much interaction between those two guys and with the coaching that they're getting, as you would see in most other NFL buildings. So I do think they'll have a fine working relationship, but it may not be something where like they have to interact daily and again i don't think it's going to cause problems if they do have to but i think that's a sort of unique wrinkle that the falcons may be having uh where those two guys may be siloed to different parts of the building and you mentioned that the multi-year plans that you the falcons have kind of outlined for Kirk cousins and michael Penix and what that could look like my question to you aaron is is do you wholeheartedly believe in that plan is it something where just like i don't don't really know and when we look back on this pick maybe in four or five years Do you think it could be, hey, this was a major mistake from Atlanta, or do you think it can all pan out for him? It can pan out for him, but I think the odds are stacked against them at this point in time. They they just need to simply win. They need to, to prove everybody wrong by going out there and winning games this year with Kirk Cousins, making the playoffs. Otherwise, everybody's going to be sitting here second guessing, hey, you could have drafted someone that could actually help you make the playoffs this past year. And you spent all that money on Kirk Cousins to miss the playoffs. The, that was the comment that Raheem Morris made. We don't plan on being picking this high. Well, the Falcons have had the eighth overall pick for three straight drafts. They've been picking 
you know, outside of the playoff teams for six straight years. So, you know, heard that before. So, you know, my skepticism is a little warranted because Raheem Morris isn't the first coach to say, oh, we're not going to pick this high again. And then they wind up picking that high the very next year. So I, I do think there is a path for success if they can win immediately under Kirk Cousins. And then three years from now, you know, I think if you're scripting this for Hollywood, then, you know, you, you might make the playoffs for the next two years. And then you sort of see the, the shortcomings of Kirk Cousins in the postseason, which is uh, off criticism of him uh, these last couple of years. Um, and then you insert Michael Penix into the lineup and then he takes the team to the next level. That's the way it sort of gets that Hollywood ending. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things have to happen between now and then before the Falcons get there. And I, I think skepticism is warranted. Yeah, so you're definitely leaning more towards mistake than than it panning out is, is what I'm getting there, Aaron. But to me, obviously, it's not just about the panic particular. That's obviously the biggest storyline. Atlanta did have other picks throughout this draft. How do you like what they did outside of Michael Penix days two, three, and how they rounded out their class? Yeah, I, I, I certainly like the fact that they invested in their defensive front. As I mentioned before, their pass rush, you know, as it sits here today, is not looking great. Uh, Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata, two older players, both at the age of 31. Grady Jarrett celebrated his birthday on April 28th. Happy birthday, Grady Jarrett. But, uh, you know, they really need those guys to do a lot of the heavy lifting for their pass rush. They drafted Arnold Ebkedi, uh two years ago in the second round. He also needs to make a big leap forward. And so I, it made sense to me for the Falcons to invest heavily in their defensive line just to have more bodies in that room so they can keep guys like Grady Jarrett and Arnold Ebiketti and David Onyemata fresher so that they can do the heavy lifting. Uh, but they did not really – add more firepower to their wide receiver room. They did not really invest at all in the secondary where they potentially could use two new starters, one at corner, one at safety. Uh, so I'm wondering if the Falcons are going to be proactive in the post-draft free agency period to address some of those issues. Aaron's great. And for more on Aaron, check him out over at the Locked On Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Coming up in the second part of the show, we'll move to Minnesota. Talk with Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings about J.J. McCarthy. Stay tuned, plenty to talk about here on Locked On NFL. First, the show is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed that's $150 bucks, win or lose. Better than everything from slap shots to home runs, slam dunks, all to nap to safe, secure, and easy to use. The Denver Nuggets, they lost to the Lakers last night. They play again tonight. Jamal Murray questionable for that game. I'm really, I'm really hoping as a big Nuggets guy, they're not going to be the first team to blow a 3-0 lead. But hopefully... They get some automatic wins. And what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel America's number one sportsbook. And the show is brought to you by Game Time. Now, it would be really cool for me to attend an NBA playoff game. I'm super excited for the playoffs in general. Again, I am a big Never Nuggets guy. Now, Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from receipt, and their lowest price guarantee. Game time days to guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. Now we know playoff tickets, they, they can get expensive, but on the game time app, they have so many things to make the ticket buying process easy. For me, I mean, look, Nuggets Lakers, that, that's a heck of a series. It's 3 1 right now. I'd, I'd love to go to a game like that. But now, Game Time has last minute tickets on their app, flash deals, zone deals. They have all in pricing, seat views, the lowest price guarantee, Game Time ticket coverage. But those last minute deals, you can save up to 60% off buying last minute tickets for sports, concert, comedy, theater, and more. Take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with Game Time down the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code Lockdown NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account. Redeem code Lockdown NFL. Spell L C K D O N NFL for $20 off. Download Game Time with the last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. We're back for our second segment of Locked On NFL. Kevin Ostriker still talking with you here. We talked with Aaron Freeman of Locked On Falcons about that Michael Penix pick. Now let's talk with Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings. They get J.J. McCarthy. Obviously, they needed a quarterback after losing Kirk Cousins to the Atlanta Falcons. Let's talk with Luke now about the pick. The Minnesota Vikings got their guy in J.J. McCarthy. Trading up only one spot wasn't the big trade-up everybody might have been envisioning for the Vikings. But hey, you know what? Still a trade-up here to talk about that with me is Luke Braun, the host of Locked On Vikings. And Luke, there's no secret that Minnesota was trying to get a quarterback in this draft after Kirk Cousins goes to 
Atlanta. They were linked to J.J. McCarthy for a while. Maybe they were trying to get up into that number three, number five range, but they end up trading up to number 10 and landing J.J. McCarthy. Was this the move you were hoping for from Minnesota? I, I mean, hope of hopes. I was hoping to get up to three and take Drake May. Patriots yeah. say no. It is what it is. You know, that's the that's their choice. Um, and then it, yeah, you just you hope you walked away with someone you can feel good about. And I think they did. I, I like JJ McCarthy. I would have been a lot more disappointed if they ended up with Penix or Knicks. That's just my opinion on those guys. So being able to walk away with uh with JJ McCarthy and keep uh, the the other first round pick and use it on a guy that is like a pretty big steal on the board. And keep the 2025 first. I honestly didn't think that that was something worth even expecting. So yeah, I'm I'm happy with the value there. I'm happy with the guy. It's not the perfect ideal situation I wanted, but you can like more than one outcome. Right. And I think for McCarthy, he's a guy that was a very fast riser throughout the draft process. And a lot of teams felt like they could be landing spots. But what do you like about McCarthy? What can he bring to Minnesota and what's the ceiling, do you think, from McCarthy in Minnesota right now? I, ceiling, I don't believe in ceilings. Uh, ceiling is is uh, just another word for you don't think he's that good. But <laughs> I, I mean, he can be the guy. Yeah, uh, there's stuff you got to fix. We, we I, I'll get into it in a lot of detail over the next uh, couple of weeks on Locked On Vikings. Um, you know, stuff with the way that he throws stuff with his feet, um, stuff with the, the way that he reads. I think that can be like optimized, but right now in the short term, I mean, long term, the ceiling is franchise quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings, making them competitors, right? Like that's what right. you want. Uh, but right now the question is just uh, how long do we have to wait before he gets on the field? Um, you know, how many Sam Darnold games are we going to see? That's the question that we're going to be talking about for the next three months. And that's all going to be up to Josh McCown, his QB coach up to Kevin O'Connell, uh, up to everybody else on that offensive staff. There's a couple other people that are going to be working with him. All, what do they want to change about his game and his process and his mechanics and his brain? And how long will all that stuff take to change where you're not going to be giving him necessarily, okay, you know, here's the game plan for the Jets. Like, you don't want to be doing that with him if you're just going to be developing. So how long is he going to be doing that? And how long, how much patience are we going to have with Sam Darnold? If he throws three picks in the game, do we start to rush that process? That's always the the, the temptation that can really get you to mess this up. Right, and that's what I was going to ask you next is just when are we going to see McCarthy on the field from Minnesota? And we're so far out, Luke. I mean, training camp is going to determine a lot about just where McCarthy is in preseason with those reps. But is this a situation where you think it is going to be darn a week one no matter what, no matter if McCarthy performs really well or not? Or do you feel like there's a shot he gets the week one job if he beats out Darnold for the job? I wouldn't say no matter what, right? There's a world. You'll, they'll compete. They'll, they'll have a God's honest competition, I bet, in camp. You know, who's going to be the better quarterback? And the question will come down to who gives us the best chance to win this week, right? Like, the, what, what's what's best for the game in front of us will be the question once we get to in-season. But when you're going through camp, you're not really thinking about that yet. You're thinking about what's best for J.J. McCarthy. And if, you know, you're saying, man, if we put him in, this bad habit will get, like, kind of encouraged. You know, this if, if he's under fire, he's not going to be able to think through this yet. You know, he's not ready then it's totally valid to put Sam Darnold in for as long as you feel like you need to until you feel like the Sam Darnold is the threshold. Once you feel like JJ McCarthy gives you a better chance to win the game than Sam Darnold, he is ready and not a moment before. Yeah. And, and that makes sense because for Minnesota, you're trying to win, but you're also trying to put JJ McCarthy in the best situation possible based off of where he is in his development. Now, Luke, it wasn't just JJ McCarthy who the Vikings got in the first round. The Vikings mm -hmm. made another trade up. They traded with Jacksonville uh -huh. and they get Dallas Turner, the edge from Alabama, the edge rusher class, and honestly, the corner class, just for a side note, fell a little further than people anticipated, especially a guy like Dallas Turner, who some people thought was going to go maybe eight to Atlanta. And then obviously Kirk Cousins got a new friend over there. And <laughs> yeah, it got a little weird in Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Michael, Michael Penix. So old friend to you, Kirk Cousins gets a new friend and Michael Penix over there. But Dallas Turner falls to Minnesota. I know Minnesota Luke had the John Grenard, Daniel Hunter swap earlier this off season. What does Dallas Turner bring and how pumped were you that he was still there for Minnesota to trade up and get? Yeah. I'm stunned, right? Like, whoa, he, I mean, 
not too stunned that all the defensive players fell just because of the nature of the board. You've got five quarterbacks went in the top 10, three wide receivers went in the top 10. That's what there's only two players left. And one of them was Joe Alt, like, and JC Latham. There's your top 10, right? Like, of course, all those guys went top 10. And now suddenly you've got the first defender off the board coming at pick 15. I believe it was yeah. right. You had other yeah. defenders or other, other, uh, you know, another quarterback who goes to the Broncos, other offensive linemen. So yeah, the, the Brock Bowers, like the, there's, um, like that offensive run just pushes the defense down the board. You know, only 10 players can be top 10, even though you feel like there's more players worth it. Uh, and I, I think Quasi wanted to be at that kind of excess point. Um, but I, I think more so they probably just had Dallas Turner as like a top as like the eighth player or something on their board. I bet seventh player on their board, something like that. And went, Oh my God, he's actually in range. Let's make this happen. Uh, I very, ex very great Flores fit. Um, you know, versatile can rush from inside, from outside can drop into coverage, can do all of the different fancy schmancy things that Flores likes to do. Uh, so I, I think that's probably why they had par partially why they had such a high grade on them, but it's not like that was a hot take. A lot of people had Dallas Turner as not only the top edge on the board, but the top defensive player period on the board. And I believe on FanDuel, he is the favorite to be defensive rookie of the year. <laughs> so yeah, they, they saw that falling. And I think it was, this was opportunism. This wasn't like, oh, and then we're going to trade up again. This, I don't know how planned that was ahead of time. This is, it's contingent on, well, yeah, if Dallas Turner starts falling, yeah, we'll go up, but that certainly won't happen. And then it does. And now you're ready to do it. Luke with that Vikings insight. And for more on Luke, check him out over at the Lockdown Vikings podcast, part of Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Coming up, we're not done talking quarterbacks yet. Bo Nix goes to the Denver Broncos. We'll talk with Sarah Benger of Lockdown Broncos about that coming up next. First, the show is brought to you by Monopoly Go. All right, game off. We got to pause here to talk more about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. Flag on the play. You already talked about that. But there's just so much good stuff in this game. Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much more to get. Unique stickers you can trade with a friend and complete albums for big prizes. Cool new playing pieces to travel boards with. Hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a Robot Pachinko Machine. And there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it now free on Google Play or the App Store. Game on. We're back. Our final segment of the Lockdown NFL. Kevin Allstriker is still here with you. Really appreciate everybody tuning in here on this Monday, making Lockdown NFL your first listen each and every day. Be sure to subscribe, video form, audio form, the whole nine yards. A lot of quarterback talk, draft officially over. Let's now talk with Sarah Bender of Lockdown Broncos. The Broncos took Bo Nix. Is he the right fit for Denver? We'll get into it all now. The Denver Broncos select Bo Nix at number 12 overall in the 2024 NFL Draft. Here to talk about that and all things Denver Broncos with me is Sarah Bedinger, one of the hosts over at Locked On Broncos. And Sarah, I think for a lot of people, there was a lot of conversation in Denver about, well, what are they going to do with this pick? Obviously, they brought in a quarterback not so long ago and Mr. Zach Wilson himself, but obviously that's not the long-term answer you want in Denver right now. So they go out, they select Bo Nix out of Oregon. Was this the right pick to you? And how are you on Bo Nix in terms of what you think his upside can be? I think it was the right pick just because you, you we talked in the pre-draft process about are they really going to take a quarterback? At, like Sean Payton has never taken a first-round quarterback or a second-round quarterback. George Payton, the general manager of the Broncos, he's, I mean, he's not known for taking first-round quarterbacks either. So it was kind of just like, is this all talk? Are they going to try to find a way to, you know, get a veteran in and kind of punt the situation until you get a free agent next year? I think they did the right thing. Cody and I talked about this shortly after the Broncos were eliminated from postseason contention. And you watch all these teams in the playoffs and you know, this as a Ravens guy, I mean, most of the best teams in the NFL right now got a first round quarterback on their roster that they drafted or that somebody else drafted in the first round. So I think you need to have that first round player at the position. If you're Denver, you take a shot, you take a swing and all the talk in this process, how, how perfect of a fit is Bo Nix for Sean Payton? I don't know about all the Drew Brees comparisons, right? But, but I mean, at the same time, you know, you just need somebody to operate the offense, take the shots when needed. I think he was the right pick. 
And I like the, I know a lot of people say, well, he's maxed out because he's 24 years old. He's, he's one of the oldest rookie quarterbacks in first round history. I feel like the upside with Bo Nix is what he's capable of doing over time in Sean Payton's offense. I mean, you talk about what's it like or, or, or what's it going to be like when the game starts to slow down for a young quarterback. I feel like Bo Nix doesn't get enough credit for the strides that he, although he does get a lot of credit, I still don't think it's enough for the, the player that he was at Auburn that I remember watching a few years back to the player that he became at Oregon. I mean, it's just a stark difference in, you know, stylistically the way that he honed his skills, the way that people have kind of forgotten, like this guy was a five-star dual threat coming out of the high school ranks. Now he's, you know, known for more for being a pocket passer, quick strike passer. So I like the upside. I like the fit. And I think it's a great pick. And when you look at Bo Nixon, the timeline, say, or when it just comes to Denver being competitive with him as the starter, is this something? Because it's not just all on Bo Nix here. It's about the roster Denver is building around him, both in free agency and obviously the rest of the picks, which we'll get to. But do you think that Bo Nix could maybe surprise some people as a rookie, take this Denver roster to contention, or is there still a lot more work to be done? I think that they can surprise a lot of people. I mean, this is a team that won eight games last year with basically the ghost of Russell Wilson or what we know to be Russell Wilson. And and yeah, they got hot for a little bit last season, but they also started off historically bad. I mean, just imagine if the Broncos didn't have a, a historically terrible defense for the first six, seven weeks of last season. They might have won 10 games. I mean, they blew a, a 21 to three lead against the Washington Commanders, fumbled away a potential comeback victory against the Jets. First and goal from the eight against the Houston Texans. I mean, they were that close to a three-game swing of their overall record. And so I just think with the way that they played and kind of overachieved last year, I don't think Sean Payton gets enough credit now for how good of a coach he was with the New Orleans Saints, building contenders in different eras of football. And I know he had Drew Brees, but remember, those the teams that he had back in 2006 uh, through, the, through 2010 are way different than the teams that he had from 2015 to 2021. So it's just different eras of football. He's adjusted. He's adaptable. The roster, as far as the roster is concerned, the Broncos were eighth in uh, you know ESPN's offensive line metrics in pass block win rate last year. They were third in run block win rate last year. The offensive line, much better than given credit because Russell Wilson, according to Pro Football Focus, ran into at least almost 30 sacks on his own. They credited the Broncos offensive line with 17 sacks allowed and Russell took 45. So do the quick math on that one, whatever the difference between those two number is I think that this roster is much better than it's given credit although it may need a little bit of overachieving to to make the wild card or something like that I think nine wins or ten wins potentially in an overachieving type of season is well within reach given where the roster's at right now right and Denver didn't have a second round pick this year but they end up rounding out their roster with a couple of really solid picks throughout the rest of the draft process both on day two and day three Sarah how do you think Denver did outside of the first round, adding around the roster they already had. I love what they did. I mean, you support the Bo Nix selection by going after a guy who's going to get after the quarterback, Jonah Ellis, in round three. So how does that support the quarterback selection? Well, when you add to your pass rush, you hope to be able to get your quarterback more possessions, get off the field quickly, create turnovers. You add to that pass rush group that was already young and athletic and talented and on the rise. I love I love that pick. and I, But I don't know if anybody's going to love – any pick more than Troy Franklin near the top around four, right? Because not only was he Bo Nix's college teammate, but everything that I heard, Kevin, was that this guy's supposed to go in the second round. I mean, there was dreams that Broncos fans were having leading up to the draft. Like, man, I wish we had a second round pick. You know, if the team's really going to take Bo Nix, it would be awesome to be able to get Troy Franklin, but that's not going to happen. Well, it did happen. And now you add him to a receiver room that Throughout the second and third day of the draft, you kind of shockingly didn't trade Cortland Sutton. You've got Marvin Mims coming up through the ranks. And, and now you've added a, another speed weapon at that wide receiver position. But I think the most underrated move that, that was made by the Broncos throughout this whole weekend was getting John Franklin Myers on the D-line in a trade with the New York Jets because that defensive line, that was the one area where you were like, Man, if if the Broncos had a second round pick, they could take, you know, I know they looked at Tavondre Sweat from Texas in the lead up to the draft. Like you just wish that they could have had a second round choice to be able to beef up that D line because they were 32nd in the NFL last year in rushing yards allowed, 32nd in yards per carry allowed. 
they added Malcolm Roach in free agency, but it was kind of just like, oh, is that is that enough? Then you make the trade for John Franklin Myers, get yourself a legit starter who's been really good over the last four or five years. I mean, that changed the complexion, I think, of that whole defensive line in one fell swoop. So it was a great draft weekend, in my opinion, for the Denver Broncos. Sarah is great with that Broncos insight. And for more on Sarah, check him out over to Locked On Broncos podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team. Every day. That's all I have for you here today on Lockdown NFL. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Coming up tomorrow, more NFL content with your Tuesday host. So be sure to stay tuned. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on Lockdown NFL.